Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. And may I, first of all, given that we're only seven days away, I uh, wish all of you a very, very happy St. Patrick's Day. My name is Declan Black. I'm the managing partner of Mason Hayes and Curran, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. And as is customary for events surrounding St. Patrick's Day, this event is themed and aimed to address issues which are relevant to entities looking at doing business in or through Ireland and who consider Ireland as a potential gateway to the European Union. Since the departure of the United Kingdom from the Union, Ireland has become the only English speaking common law system member of the Union. And particularly for businesses with an Anglo-Saxon heritage that confers a number of advantages. You get an approach systems, structures, and a business culture with which you're familiar and you get the market access to. These are the themes which our keynote speaker, the Minister for Finance will address and which will be addressed by our distinguished panel. So the format for today is that Minister Donoghue uh, will make a few remarks and then we'll move straight to a panel discussion chaired by my corporate partner, Claire Lord. At any time from now, you can type in a question through the Q&A function and Claire will look to pull out themes uh, to bring to the panel's attention and we'll see what we can address. Just to flag that the minister is very pressed for time, so he's going to have to drop off at about 4.30. So get your questions in quickly and we'll try and get a response as soon as possible. For those of you not familiar uh, with Minister Donoghue, he has been uh, a member of the Irish Parliament for a decade now. Uh, he has been the Minister for Finance in two successive governments. And prior to that, he was the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. He also chairs uh, the Eurogroup of Finance Ministers. Uh, and he brings to uh, economic analysis uh, a knowledge, a rigor, but also an understanding for the impact of the economy and society that's truly admirable. Minister, you're very, very welcome. We're really grateful to have you here and we're very interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening uh, to everyone. And I want to begin by thanking Declan and all of the team in Mason, Hayes and Curran for organizing this event and for allowing me to say a few words at it as their guest. Um, it is great to have the opportunity to say a few words to so many who do either have an interest in Ireland or considering having an interest in Ireland across the uh, coming uh, period. And I know the value in these sessions really emerges in the questions and answers when I have the opportunity to respond back to points that guests wish to put to me. And I'm looking forward to doing that in a few moments time. What I want to do in the few moments that are open to me is just to say a few words about a number of different themes. Uh, firstly, uh, to say a word about St. Patrick's Day and what it means for our country and the celebration that normally takes place in our country and across the world at that point. Secondly, I want to talk about the kind of changes that are underway uh, inside Europe and in particular inside the countries that use the Euro, the Eurozone. And then finally, just to emphasize uh, a number of points about where Ireland stands at the moment and uh, where we're likely to move to across the coming years that I hope will be of interest again to current or potential investors within our country. Uh, so this is, as Declan has said, uh, the uh, run in to St. Patrick's Day. And this St. Patrick's Day will be the second one in recent years that is so different to what St. Patrick's Day normally looks like St. Patrick's Day normally looks like a, a day uh, that is celebrated in cities and towns all over the world in which people come together uh, to celebrate either uh, uh, being Irish or their relationship with Ireland. Of course, this won't be happening for the second year in a row uh, due to all of our efforts to stay safe. And instead, what will be happening 
is the government will be engaging with other governments across the world through the technologies that we've become all too familiar with. But there are a number of qualities in uh, how we celebrate St. Patrick's Day uh, that are really, really relevant to the dimensions of the Irish economy and to what makes our economy both competitive and also a good place within which to do either business in or from. Uh, normally when we come together in St. Patrick's Day events, we uh, recognize two qualities that are really important about how my country sees itself. The first one is the pride that we have been in Irish and being Irish, but also the pride that we have in Irish communities that are all over the world. Um, and that speaks to something that is a really important quality about the Irish economy. It's a very open economy. It's a very diverse economy. It's an economy that places great value on trade and an economy that places a great value on the relationship that we have with many countries, uh, but particularly the relationship that we would have with America that has a, a very strong uh, cultural and historical foundation on top of which we've overlaid a really, really important economic relationship. The other feature that is very important about those kind of celebrations when they occur and when they will occur in more normal times is um, it does give us an opportunity to reflect on those relations. Relations that are really, really important with different towns, with different cities and with different countries all over the world that we have used to rebuild a very global economy here in Ireland, a very open economy here in Ireland, and an economy that places great value on developing relationships that work uh, over many years and many decades. That leads on to where we are in a world that is changing so much, and a world that is changing so much for many reasons, but the most immediate of which is this terrible pandemic and the terrible disease of COVID-19. So if I move on to the second area of change, uh, which is what's happening in Europe and how Europe is responding back to this kind of change. As always, it's a Europe that is never static. It's a Europe that is changing. And the most recent example of that change is the very regressible uh, departure of the United Kingdom from the European Union. Uh, but nonetheless, despite that exit, we've seen a European Union that has changed very positively in a number of ways, even in recent months. We've seen the euro area economy decline very, very, very sharply last year. But we saw, uh, particularly across the uh, second and third quarter of last year, a rate of decline that wasn't quite as bad as we would have expected, though was still very, very difficult. But due to that kind of change and due to the kind of risks that we recognise as developing, particularly inside countries that use uh, and share the euro as our common currency, it was the catalyst for some really important and forward looking change within the European Union. The two examples of this that I will pick out is the agreement that was made within the European Union to how we can accelerate uh, our transition to a, a lower carbon and then in effect over time then um, a, a, an economy that minimizes its use of carbon to the highest level of poss possible. We saw an agreement reached in, amongst leaders of the European Union regarding targets that we wanted to reach in 2030 and beyond and we saw that agreement reached in December. Economically, the most important agreement that was reached was in relation to the Recovery and Resilience Fund. And the ORRF is a fund that is going to issue both debts and loans in excess of 650 billion euro that will be funded by the common issuance of debt for the, euro, for the European Union. And this is a really signature development in the modern European Union. Uh, because it is in effect giving us a new economic tool to deal with the kind of new risks that could be created by COVID-19. And then finally, within that change in Europe, uh, there are so many things that are underway here in Ireland that despite the great challenges that we face, uh, I do believe are really positive and I do believe will create a new sense of momentum for Ireland as we rebuild from COVID. 
Uh, we have been reminded again of the huge importance in foreign direct investment and international investment within our country and within our economy. We saw Ireland being the only country last year in the European Union that from a gross domestic product actually recorded growth. But when you do strip out the effect of very large countries, uh, companies and the effect that they have on our economy, we did see the kind of decline in our domestic economy uh, that is more in line with what developed economies saw across the world. But nonetheless, we have seen within our country and our economy qualities that remind us of what is important about our economy and qualities that we're going to build on upon the years to come. We were reminded of the value of international trade, international investment, and companies being located in Ireland in which we have had a relationship now for many, many decades. And we have seen that continue to be an engine that moves the economy forward to a place of stability, and indeed, I believe, a place of growth across this year and next year. What we have used that to do in combination with having a really well-run economy with a very broad tax structure and a very low level of macroeconomic imbalances of any at all, uh, we've used that to fund an exceptional set of supports within the Irish economy to protect employment and income within our country that I see not only being how we offer a source of insulation to our citizens and to employers at a time of risk, but I also see that as laying the foundation for a recovery that I believe will happen within Ireland and will happen quickly within Ireland. Uh, we have made great efforts to contain and beat this disease. As with any country, we've had moments that have been very difficult. We've had moments that have been more difficult than others. But we now have underway a community vaccination program uh, that is going to make a very big difference to our country and our economy by the summer. That is building off public health measures that have been really well implemented in Ireland. That means that the actual incidence of COVID within our country over the lifespan of this disease so far compares really well with the international norm and the kind of experiences that we could have faced into. Um, and in summary, and I'll end on that point, point Declan, it does reflect things that I think are important without our, about our country. A country that has strong uh, institutions, a company that, country that places so much value on how we engage uh, with uh, partners and friends all over the world, and a country that places great value on the mix of openness and predictability and maintaining political and societal consensus to those values now for many, many, many decades. And normally we'd be able to talk about this in person in different parts of the world. We can't do this in this St. Patrick's Day, but nonetheless, they are qualities and features to the modern Irish economy that will make a huge difference to how we move through this disease. They're already making a big difference. And I think continue to make Ireland a place in which many companies want to invest in and do business from. Uh, but for those companies or investors that are not doing that at the moment, um, I hope you will consider the potential opportunities that are there. And Declan, if there are any questions that anybody wants to put to me on any of the points that I've made, I'll do my very best to respond back to them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Donoghue. Um, appreciate, like Declan, you, you taking the time to be with us today. Um, my name is Claire Lord, as Declan has already said. I'm a corporate partner here at Mason Hayes and Curran. And I'd like now to, to welcome our panellists. Um, we're delighted to, 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 today to, to, to have joining us um, Connor Walsh, Danny McCoy and Sinead McSweeney. Um, Sinead is the Managing Director of, of Twitter, uh, Twitter's operations in Ireland, and she's also Twitter's public she also leads Twitter's public policy teams in Europe, the Middle East and Asia. Um, Connor Walsh is the general manager of Thera, Thera Technologies and Thera Technologies is a pharma business that has brought specialized therapies to market, including for HIV. European headquarters of Thera Technologies is in Dublin. Um, and finally, we have Danny McCoy. Danny is the CEO of IBEC. Uh, for those of you that, that aren't Irish, aren't Irish 
the that's the Irish Business and Employers Confederation and it's our premier business representative group. So thank you all very much. Um, so thank you very all very much for, for, for joining us. Um, my first question today is for you, um, Minister Donoghue. You, you've mentioned the RRF or the Recovery and Re Resilience Facility um, that's been put in place to help member states address the economic and social impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I believe we have till the end of April to submit our own national recovery and resilience plan to receive support from the fund. So there's clearly a lot going on at, at the EU level to support economic and, and social recovery. Could you expand a little on this um, and also what's being done perhaps at a micro level um, by national government to assist in, in Ireland's recovery? Um, uh, thanks very much uh, for that question, Claire. Uh, so yes, indeed, uh, we have to make a submission to the European Union uh, for use of the funds that would become available through the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Uh, due to our level of uh, economic growth, and due to the fact that we've now become a net contributor to the European Union, it doesn't quite represent the injection of, uh, of income uh, that it will from many other countries within the European Union. But it is still an initiative that's very important to Ireland for two reasons. The first reason is any initiative that stabilizes and binds together in a, in a stronger way, the Euro area and the European Union is good for Ireland. Uh, because our economic prospects are intertwined uh, with that of uh, the Euro area and the EU. So on a very macro level, it is positive for us. Uh, in terms then of what it will be available to us nationally, um, that will be um, a mixture of loans and grants. We have put in a submission to the European Commission in relation to projects that we believe could benefit from that funding. Uh, the mix uh, of projects is a, um, a majority have to, of the projects have to be orientated towards a green and a digital transition. And uh, we have uh, put in some options to the European Commission of projects that we believe would meet those criteria. And myself now, Minister Michael McGrath, will be meeting, meeting with the Commissioner that has responsibility for this, which is Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni in the coming weeks uh, to look at our submission and to engage with the Commission on it. Uh, the deadline for those submissions being in is towards the end of April. So we're well advanced in our engagement with the European Union. And I, I do think the way in which this will really matter is anything that strengthens the foundations of the EU is ultimately good for our country that plays such, such value on the European Union and on our relationship with us. Thank you, Minister. Um, and Danny, I, I might bring you in here. I, I know that IBEC has been engaging with government about the availability of, of, of greater supports for businesses impacted by the pandemic restrictions. And you've also recently remarked, as, as Pascal did in, in his opening remarks, about our two economies, our, our outward facing economy that was undisrupted in, in many ways by COVID-19, but our domestically focused economy that was. Um, so obviously we, we, we clearly need to stabilize our domestic economy. But, but in doing this, um, we should also be able to ensure that Ireland continues to be, an attract, to be attractive for foreign direct investment. I'd, I'd, I'd welcome your, your, your views on the importance of, 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 of stabilizing me measures for, for this reason also. Yeah, thanks very much, Claire, and good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to acknowledge what uh, Minister Donoghue just said there, for, particularly for the international audience. Um, in his role as president of the Eurogroup, I think it's a really significant um, combination of the firepower of the EU to address some of the needs that are actually probably more significant in other member states. And so I think that's a real leadership role, not just personified by the minister, but also by the Irish uh, society and the business model as well is that this is, is very much a globalized hub and the expression of those resources being channeled right across the EU I think are really significant so that's that's a really um, significant piece of work but coming back to the minister's day job as well in, in, the, in the domestic economy I, I think Claire that what we saw last year was a very significant build-up of the state 
underpinning not just the business community, but also the wider society here in Ireland. And in fact, you, you'd see some fairly spurious uh, league tables, which suggest that, that the uh, level of intervention with the Irish government is lower than other jurisdictions. Those are contingent loan capacities, which uh, a, lot of, a lot of people aren't taking up, given the, uh, given the nature of them being debt um, elements. So I think that the package that's put together here in Ireland is really off the scale that's required. And probably what's caught us, as you said, about the kind of K-shaped recovery, um, there is quite a distinct difference, in, and the minister mentioned it as well, in the domestic economy, that some of the focus now in this kind of prolonged phase probably needs a little bit more targeting um, specifically. But, but overall, overall, we know there's effective demand in the economy. It's a question of keeping that supply side intact um, to, to benefit from that, hopefully, in the summer. But, but overall, I think the scale of government intervention has been really a, a top notch, actually, in contrast to other jurisdictions. And I think that's a symbiosis of the, the connection between government and business working together. Um, and we do that very effectively through different fora, such as the Labour Employer Economic Forum, which brings together trade unions, businesses and government to try to work through the challenges we have. Thank you, Danny. Um, and I guess some, somewhat related to you know the, the comments re regarding trade, I'm going to take a question from from our audience, and it, it actually brings us to the question of the location of the Irish border. Um, so I, I don't want to to necessarily lose ourselves down the, the rabbit hole of Brexit, but I do think it is an important an, an important question to ask. Um, the, the question we've been asked is is you know trade with Europe is critical to our economic health. Um, and a minister, how do you expect to resolve the puzzle of where to place the border between the UK and Europe? Well, we've already resolved that puzzle and we've resolved that puzzle through the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, which took place through painstaking efforts from the European Commission, uh, who represented European interest in this matter uh, very, very effectively and very, very consistently. So the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, through the um, a status uh, that was agreed uh, that has been afforded to Northern Ireland and made clear in how uh, such issues are going to be dealt with in the future. Uh, there is, as your viewers will know and be aware of, uh, continued political focus and developments in relation to that. But all of our efforts from an Irish point of view are going into uh, preserving and protecting the agreement and the protocol. And we do that for many reasons, but one of the reasons is at the heart of the modern Irish economy is our membership of the single European market. Uh, and uh, we will protect our relationship with the single market and ensure that it is not changed in any way uh, by a decision that has been made by a neighbour and indeed a friend to leave the European Union. So for those reasons, the Northern Ireland Protocol is the way we look to get that balance right. Uh, and it is something that we're working very hard on to look at how that is uh, preserved and implemented. Thank you, Minister. Um, so I'm, I'm conscious we don't we don't have a, a lot of time, a lot of time left with you. And I might try and um, without meaning to, to jump around too much, I might try and just ask you, and one question related to, to our, you know, our taxation regime, and then we might touch briefly on our remote working strategy. Um, but we won't draw you into the full discussion on the latter, because I know that, that, that I have other panelists who have an interest in that. But around um, our, our corporation tax rate, and absolutely appreciate the, the, the government's commitment to our 12.5% rate. But we're also aware that change is likely inevitable. We've got the OECD's plans for corporate tax reform, with the advent of digital taxes, and now we have the Biden administration. So looking at 2021, how is that all, how do you, how do you see that playing out? It's difficult at this point to be clear on that question, uh, Claire, uh, because there is a process underway within the OECD that even though it has very uh, laudable ambitions regarding what it is looking to deliver, it's a very, very, very complex process and negotiation um, and it's very likely they'll be able to reach agreement, but it's not yet certain that that, that agreement will happen. 
Um, but I, I do believe it is more likely than not that some form of agreement will be reached and Ireland will be working to uh, see, you know, can we influence that agreement, which I believe we will be able to, in a way that gets the balance right between a consensus for global tax reform and change, and also recognising that that needs to work and should work for small, medium-sized and big countries as well. In terms of how we're going to look to manage that from an Irish point of view, there are there is change coming. Uh, that change is coming for many, many, many different reasons, but it is coming. And we'll be working very, very hard to preserve uh, key elements of our corporate tax code that are fundamental to our sovereignty and also are an important part of our economic model. And then what we'll do, Claire, is uh, we will manage that process transparently here in Ireland. We will engage with stakeholders about how we see the negotiation unfolding. And we will be as predictable and as transparent as we can be, while also working very, very hard to preserve uh, those parts of our policy that we believe are particularly important to Ireland. So uh, yes, change is coming. Uh, but within that change, there are opportunities for our country and we look to manage the change and maybe even uncertainty by being as transparent as we can with business partners here in Ireland and laying out our priorities really clearly. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. And for, forgive me now for jumping on to an entirely different topic, but we, we, we would welcome your, your, your views on this subject also. Um, so, um, we, we were looking at Ireland post pandemic and the, the national remote working strategy was published in January. Um, now, before I actually get, get your view of, views on it, Minister, I'd, I'd actually like to go to Sinead to get her view on remote working generally and decentralising our workforce, because I, th I think we're all quite aware that Twitter has been very progressive in this space. So over to you, Sinead. Yeah, um, thanks a million and, and, and thanks for the discussion already. Um, yeah, so Twitter moved very quickly in the context of the pandemic to send its global workforce home. And that was kind of a, a commitment on the part of our CEO to you know, reduce mobility, whether it was travel or movement in the community um, using our workforce. But it also married with a kind of a stated commitment and ambition he has about having a decentralized workforce and you know, having a workforce that reflects the diversity of, of the platform. So it's been interesting, I guess, to do almost a, a live experiment with it. Um, and, uh, you know, overall, I think, um, I, I don't see us moving fully to a remote working uh, model. I think that even to the extent that we have survey surveyed existing employees, um, there's, there's more of an appetite for a hybrid model, depending on the types of work that people are doing um, at any point in time, whether there's Kind of uh, team aspects, whether there's um, kind of you know deep work and, and thoughtful work, etc. Um, it it also we have to put a lot of measures in place to support remote working. Um, that's everything from wellness and um, and kind of health and uh, that that kind of counselling, etc. Those measures through to um, just some financial allowances for people to set up. Uh, to work at home but I think it's not for everybody and it's not for every function like issues like content moderation which would be a growth area of our footprint and um, this is not necessarily something that is it's either good or healthy to do at home and um, our footprint actually grew by 37 percent while we have been working from home that's in in Ireland alone and um, so you know the biz you know our our company has grown our ability to hire and onboard people um, we've shown that it can work, we can do this remotely, um, but I think ultimately we will be looking at hybrid rather than any substantial move to, to working from home. Thank you Sinead, and, and Minister just over to you for your, your, your parting comments on that, and perhaps the impact of, of more remote working on the vibrancy of our cities. I, I agree very much with so much of what Sinead said there, um, I believe there was there is much uh, that is to be welcomed and developed regarding uh, uh, how we allow work to take place in um, uh, a place that isn't an office. But I do believe we've got to get a balance right on this. And as soon as our public health uh, does allow us, I hope we can move to that balance. I think there's a negative we have to avoid and there's a positive we have to maintain. 
The negative that we have to avoid is um, uh, the, uh, the risks of isolation, of colleagues not feeling supported, and of missing the kind of environment that brings uh, an element of, of fun to the workplace. Uh, we have here in Ireland already, and this will be the same for economies all over the world, thousands and tens of thousands of people that have either began their first work job or changed job and never physically met the people they're working with or for. And that, that really concerns me in terms of what that can mean for people's well-being and for their own resilience. Um, and there, that's a, a negative that we really do need to guard against. And we also need to be aware that the living conditions for some uh, are not living conditions that always lend themselves to being able to work at home easily. Um, and if you're doing particular kinds of work, the ability to switch off, to relax, to really be with your family, your partner, your children, your flatmate, your housemate, to really be with them, that becomes harder and harder. And they are, they are things that certainly matter to us as a society. And I think we need to be aware of that as it develops. And however, if that's about avoiding a negative, um, I would end then about how we build on a positive. Um, at the heart of what much of what we do here in Ireland is about skills, it's about productivity, it's about how we learn from each other. And the uh, a shared workspace is the big part of doing that. Uh, I, I'm sure in the environment of any of our guests, not to mention your own company, the work that you do in uh, training people, looking after them, developing them, making them feel part of a team, there are things that really matter to companies that are based here in Ireland, whether they're Irish or international. And we do it really, really, really well in Ireland. Um, and I would be eager to get back to a balance that allows us to continue to do that. Um, so I think the way Sinead summed it up there about moving to a kind of an, a, a different balance is where I think we should get to. And I believe we will get there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Donoghue. Um, I, I, I think we, we have to bid you farewell now, I believe, with your, with your timetable. And I know we've kept you longer than we said we would. Yeah, I, I, I'm so you sorry. taking the time. The Not at all. Control, I have to leave. I hope to wish you all, hope to meet you all in person soon. And again, I want to thank uh, Mason Hayes and Kern for organising this event, for inviting me along. And I look forward to being able to uh, hope participate in it physically or uh, in maybe even in this format if we have to uh, at another point soon. So thank you very much. And I hope the rest of the event goes well. Thank you. And thanks for joining. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. So we, we, we've left it there with the Minister of, of, of moving to a different way, moving to a different rhythm in terms of, of, of remote working. And Connor, I'd like to, to bring you into the discussion now. And my apologies for, for keeping you so long. Thank you for, for your patience. No problem, Karen. So Terra Technologies, um, head office in Montreal in Canada, um, your European headquarters in Dublin. So you're no stranger, I would think, to managing employees in multiple locations across different time zones. So, so firstly, did this culture help you with, with moving to working from home when COVID hit? Uh, exactly. Yeah. And, and thanks. To, I mean, contextually for Terra, Terra is, uh, uh, you know, it's a company that is very much in the innovative developmental specialized space, focusing on one or two niche therapeutic areas. Um, I, I doubt your audience knows who Terra is, but, you know, within the HIV world or within the emerging oncology platform world, Terra would be very well known and very well regarded. But so what, what we found ourselves was even pre-pandemic that a lot of the people we were engaging with were uh, key opinion leaders in their expert fields in HIV or oncology or were, um, you know, we, it, it, the company landed in Ireland to access the European market. So we, we have a lot of efforts around market access and developing our strategies to get our products to the end users within uh, Europe. So very quickly, uh, we, were, we were involved in a remote working strategy pre-pandemic, the pandemic has copper fast in that, 
But I would echo what Sinead said earlier. I, I think the hybrid model is definitely a model that Para will be looking to do and embracing going forward. Um, Thank you, Connor. Um, Danny, so this strategy speaks to the intention to legislate for the right to request, re request remote working, but also the intention to issue a code of practice around the right to disconnect. Do, do you see any disconnect or, or challenges between allowing employees to get the most out of flexible and remote working, but also having a mandated and perhaps inflexible policy around disconnecting? Yeah, I think that's going to be, you know, a particular challenge. Um, one of the virtues of a European location is the straddling of timelines um, in the working day as well. And so a right to disconnect um, at one level sounds as if it's specifically, you know, in, in a one time zone situation where we know a lot of the flexibility and a lot of the productivity that our, the Irish business model has developed is being able to straddle um, very effectively those timelines. So that clearly, I think, is, is a very specific threat to the Irish business model. Um, obviously, people want to um, have that capacity for your colleagues to know when you want to be off, which is very different than a very mandated, I'm having to be off because that's what's legislated for. So I, I think that's going to be one of the balances that we've been certainly discussing with the um, Minister for Enterprise, um, the tarnished uh, Leo Varadkar on this. And I mentioned that forum before this Labour Employer Economic Forum. Uh, we see there are quite a lot of the um, leave arrangements, a lot of the remote working, right to disconnect, statutory sick pay. There's quite a lot of interactive um, changes occurring, which I think need to be seen in the context of a system, um, a systemic view of this. And I think that Remote working in aggregate, I think, has quite a lot of things that, as an individual right, make, make sense. But when you put it into the collective, um, it may have quite unintended consequences. So this is something we'll be discussing with. But it's very difficult when you're, when you're offered that choice to say, are you for or against something? It's like motherhood and apple pie type stuff. How can you be against the right to disconnect? You know, what you want to keep people working 24 hours, seven days a week. So... There has to be some blend there. I agree with you. And look, we face the challenges ourselves. We have a lot of clients in the west coast of US. We have an office there. It's it, it's certainly something that that, that that we need to consider. And and just while we're on that point, Sinead, you know, the, the I, I think we I think we need to get to a place where we're we're clearly trusting our workforce to make adult decisions about when they can and want to work and getting their work done when they do work. And I'd welcome your 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 your, your views on that approach. Um, yeah, there, there are a couple of things. I think the point Danny made around um, flexibility is important, and I think it this is an awful lot to do with the contract. You know, the trust that should exist between um, an employer and an employee in a healthy workplace or work environment, depending on uh, on on which model we're looking at. Um, I mean, we already. We already um, work in markets which have a right to disconnect. And I have people who report to me um, in markets where there is a legal structure around um, disconnect, uh, right to disconnect um, in France, for example. Um, and you know, it hasn't impacted our ability to do business because there is a sense of that trust um, that, that that investment that the employer puts in the welfare of their employee and also a focus on the what uh, rather than the how much um, time is spent doing something, what's actually achieved as opposed to that. And, you know, we've learned a huge amount of that in the past year as well, where in order to reduce people's levels of anxiety because they were homeschooling or caring for uh, parents or whatever, you know, we had to manage, this, manage people's workload with them. Um, now, the problem is this isn't a single transferable model for every type of work. Um, you know, it depends if people are in sales, well, they need to be selling at the time that people are buying. Um, but then when you get into to other areas, there, there can be more flexibility. But a lot of it, a lot of it does come down to, um, as you say, kind of bu building that trust between employers and employee, having, 
having a flexible approach to how work gets done. Um, and I think that then can meet the needs of uh, both, um, both what the employer needs and what the company needs, uh, but what al also what individuals need. And there's something here about the mindset too, just to, that I wanted to get in. It, it, and it's, it's somehow related to the remote working piece. Um, which is that one of the attractions I know for Twitter in continuing to build out its presence in Ireland isn't just that kind of the open economy, the open society aspect of things, but that open mindset. And um, that that I think that the, the workforce here do have that ability to think of a region or think of other markets rather than just being very focused in the geographic location in which they're located. And that's part of that same thing around this ability and recognition of the need to work across time zones, meeting other people's uh, work hours, et cetera. And that's, you know, that continues to be very attractive for people investing here. Thank you, Sinead. And, and same, same question to you, Connor. Have you any, anything you want to add there around, around this whole area? No, no, very similar experiences and, and noting France as well as a country that we, we do have to be very mindful of the laws. But that open mindset point that Sinead references is, is something that we see as well within our organization. And, and that's percolating throughout the organization. When you have that open mindset, that flexibility and adaptability to, to how you approach this, um, you find that, that it, it does become a unified approach, which is working very well for us and, and is working very well for many of our competitor and, and companion companies in the sector. And after the pandemic, when you go back to the office, Connor, what, what does that look like? Um, I think it's going to be the hybrid model. It'll be um, a, a full office on occasion uh, where we have a rationale or a reason to be in the full office. I think we need to continue to listen to who we work with. Um, we have a lot of developmental um, uh, aspects going on with our business that, you know, so we, we work with hospitals, key opinion leaders, clinical trial sites, and with the Europeans. So there won't be a need to be in a desk in an office at all stages. It will be very much a hybrid model of their occasions when you'll, you'll be in the office. And we'll try to define that. And there, there'll be more likely than not occasions you don't need to be here at all. So it'll be project driven. It will, it will rely on the, the trust that, that Sinead and Danny mentioned and, and the flexibility and adaptability, which to be fair, I think, a lot of experiences in Ireland have shown we have a, we have a lot of that within the country. Um, thank you, Connor. Um, Danny, over to you now, and again connected with opening up Ireland, um, moving moving away from from workplace related questions. Um, you you've spoken before about essential international business travel, and you know the the need to 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 reintroduce that. Just speak to us a little bit about that and, and also in the shorter term, how that how that might be managed before we're all fully vaccinated. Yeah, so I guess when we look at our business model and particularly the really dramatic change, um, you know, the Irish economy has grown by over 100 percent in six years um, in terms of GDP, which is driven off the intangible assets that we see embedded in corporate balance sheets. And we know that, you know, services and capital are still very often service-based activities and people-based. So we need to be open for our business model in a way that lots of other societies actually don't. And this is about international air travel in particular. But that is, that's the model that's seen the FDI model into Ireland for subject matter experts or for investors to come to Ireland. But there's a corollary as well, which is actually even more draconian at the moment because there is some flex for that subject matter expert in the legislation to come and go. But actually the corollary is for Irish businesses uh, to go to see their assets, but particularly to go to see their customers. And that's quite a limitation. So we're gonna to need to um, have that conversation pretty quickly because we're lagged at the moment in terms of the introduction of the type of quarantine that's being proposed right now. And I think that, the, that that's quite detrimental if our vaccination program is behind and we also have these residual um, quarantines that may be out of sequence. But, but overall, notwithstanding that, they're kind of transactional um, issues. I'm quite positive about the Irish economy and going back to what the minister said, he was much more diplomatic than I will be, is that the, you know, what's not to like when you were a society that actually has, has built itself up to the level that Ireland's at now in terms of a globalized hub and if the world changed the rules to mean that there's an effective minimum corporate tax rate 
means you can't get undercut by other aspirin countries to basically do an Ireland on it. Um, and then also when you live in a jurisdiction where everybody is, is moving the goalposts of corporation tax up, down, back and forward, uh, certainty remains the premium. Now, whether the certainty is at a particular rate or that rate gets changed, which may well be the case, as the Minister was saying, may see a minimum rate that's higher than 12.5%. That doesn't mean the sky falls in, but does mean that as society, we have to put more emphasis on things other than taxation and fund for our universities, our investment, our ecosystem around innovation and so on. But we have the capacity to do that. So I'm pretty confident that Ireland um, is going to come out of the pandemic really strongly, uh, but we need not to put barriers in our way, which I think is we're referring to in some of the draconian aspects around international travel and quarantine. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Danny. Um, Sinead, you mentioned, you mentioned the mindset as, as something that um, that, that that was attractive about Ireland, about, attractive about our workforce. And, and Danny has spoken about uh, about how much else, uh, how much Ireland has to offer for, mm -hmm. for organisations looking to set up substantive businesses here. You've been on this journey with Twitter. You you joined Twitter shortly after they um they they, they set up a subsidiary here. Tell us about that journey. Tell tell us about all the the good bits and maybe some of the ugly bits if there are any. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there are a couple of aspects to it. They're, they're the very formal supports that kind of helped us along the way. You know, there's the, 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 the partnership um, and advice that comes from the IDA structure. Um, there's the, um, the, you know, kind of a lot of the really interesting initiatives from Science Foundation Ireland around research and innovation and grants and investment in, in that respect. Um, but then in the day to day, you know, one of the conversations I have with, you know, startups or entrepreneurs who are trying to figure out what their first step outside of the US is and where in Europe um, should they should they land. Um, and I refer to things like that, you know, when you're small, you need people who are flexible, who most definitely have a regional mindset, who are going to help you grow your business across Europe and across into the Middle East and down into Africa, rather than just being overly focused on the market in which they're situated, which might happen in one of the bigger economies like UK or France or Germany, where people just, it's not that they don't have ability to look beyond their borders, but I think, you know, we do have that, that, that regional mindset. And, you know, increasingly we have put our regional uh, senior roles in Dublin. Sometimes, you know, many of them are Irish people, um, but others have moved to Dublin to, to fill that role because it's, we, we sit as almost like a bridge in some senses between um, two business cultures or three, if you include the Middle East. And we do have that ability to navigate and interpret and translate. So those are all, those are all the things that we need to talk more about um, as Danny said, you know, aside from the corporate, the corporate tax rate, because um, and, and even, you know, again, when it comes to size, you know, the role of IBEC, the role of the Technology Council, the HR um, advisory groups, the privacy advisory groups, they're an incredible resource for people who are starting out on their journey in Europe and an ability to kind of leverage advice and expertise when you are not yet at the point where you can hire that um, in-house. The recent UL initiative with uh, the Collison brothers around a new approach to software engineering education, um, you know, Again, just it's almost like the list. The list is endless in terms of um, the, um, the 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 elements that make Ireland attractive, particularly in that first step into the region uh, to grow outwards, uh, kind of towards the east, as it were. Thanks, Sinead. and and Connor. I'd like to bring you in here too, and with the focus on the life sciences um you, you're 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 newer to the irish market than than, than twitter you, you're on the journey as well to establishment you're a few years in now um you know what 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 remarks have you to make about about the journey so far uh, yeah it's funny yeah, Sinead stole a bit of my thunder there but uh, yeah, a lot of very a lot of similarities uh, you know i'd have to credit the ida i think they were fantastic in you know, it obviously it predates me, but you know, there was an assessment of Europe and what's best for terror technologies and the IDA were very, very helpful with that fair and balanced approach. Um, you know, the open-mindedness is great. You know, a, a challenge for a, a smaller company that's not a household name like Terra is, you know, 
how do you find, identify and, and capture and engage with talent to join you? And um, I think that's been one thing about our, you know, the, my Irish experience and their experience that has been really positive. Um, I've been very surprised at, uh, in, in, a, in a positive way, about the amount of, of you know, people that have the innovative, you know, personalized therapeutic area of focus uh, within the Irish diaspora. Um, and I think more so, we also managed to attract people who are not necessarily Irish, had been to Ireland on holidays once perhaps, uh, were aware of, of, of this company in Ireland and applied to join and we hired those people. So it's been, it's been a fantastic experience for us. Um, we have, these roles are very hard to fill. Um, there's a lot of skill required around them. There's a lot of um, uh, nuance required around them. And we've been very successful in filling those roles. So you know, that was my add on really to, to a lot of what Sinead has, has identified. And as we flesh out, we are getting more involved within a lot of the programs and, 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 and as well from a, um, a, a pharmaceutical perspective or a life science perspective, we can avail a lot of the EMA initiatives as well, uh, such as Horizon funding and uh, opportunity to develop our clinical opportunities within, within Europe, our research opportunities. Thanks, Connor. Um, Danny, you spoke about our, our, our workforce, our education system. Um, Sinead and Connor have spoken about the, you know, the business ecosystem that we have here. Um, to, that sets such a strong foundation for, for the establishment of operations. Anything in addition to add? No, I think um, something for business leaders on both sides of the Atlantic to consider is that while business is professing to be moving away from a shareholder value to more stakeholder values, um, this ESG agenda, uh, one of the critical stakeholders is the workforce and collectivism is clearly one of the reactions to the near four decades of individualism pendulum we've seen. That swing is now coming back towards collectivism. And I think those societies that actually manage collectivism and collective bargaining and different structures um, will, will succeed. Um, and so we see the Biden administration and Secretary for Labour, uh, Marty Walsh, uh, pushing the collective bargaining and um, trade union recognition in that space. So I think the, the shifting sands of those trends um, are probably going to be in the short term post the pandemic in particular, something that we're going to have to grapple with on both sides of the Atlantic. And I think that's probably going to be a shock to quite a lot of, a lot of systems that when people make professions of what their values are, sometimes um, they haven't fully worked out um, what's going to be the demand from those that profess to be their stakeholder. Um, thanks for that, Danny. Um, so the, that, that actually brings us to, to, to nicely, quite nicely, to the end of, of our questions. It's nice to, it's nice to, to, to finish on a high. Um, I, I, I'd put it to each of Danny, Connor and Sinead if there's, if there's anything that, that they want to add be, before we wrap up. Um, anything? No, nope, all good. Well, I'd, I would like to, I'd like to thank Danny, Connor and Sinead, and of course, Minister Donoghue for, for sharing their time and their insights so, so generously today. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for joining, Gurumil Mahogic and uh, August Law, Fela Porridge, Sunagwich. That is awful. I should have been able to say that much more fluidly. Um, so thank you and happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thank you very much.